Good morning and thank you for joining us for our online service from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, this is the Lord's Day and it's also the Christmas season and we've been looking at the subject, Why Jesus Came. And uh, most people, I think, would probably say that Jesus came to die, uh, to die for our sins, and that's true. But the thing that things that we celebrate about the life of Christ uh, commemorate his birth, which was important, his virgin birth, and his death, burial, and resurrection. And what I, I want us to remember is, is that between those two events that we celebrate every year at Christmas and at Easter time, between those two things, Jesus Christ lived a life. And what he did not do in the 33 and a half years that he walked upon this earth was sit around for 33 and a half years, twiddling his thumbs and waiting uh, for the inevitable death that he was going to die for us. Jesus Christ lived a purposeful life and and things took place. He accomplished things between those two very important events that we celebrate, but he accomplished other things along the way. And the Bible talks about those things. And we don't celebrate them in the sense that we have a particular days that we set aside to celebrate these things. And for the most part, they are kind of lost on us. Uh, not not in the sense that, that we don't know about them, but they're lost on us in the sense of any, any sense of celebration of them. And yet they are very, very important things. They are vital to you and to me. And the first Two, that we first one that we talked about was that he came to reveal the Father. And, and in revealing the Father, we found that we could enjoy the Father's fellowship, uh, his comfort, we could enjoy his power in our lives, all of those things. And these were things that the Jewish people really weren't that aware of. And, and to some extent, people today are not aware of those things. And so, that was the first thing that I wanted to talk about this Christmas season. And the second thing is today, it's taken out of 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 5. And we talk about why Jesus came. He came to take away sins. Now that verse for, <coughs> excuse me, 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 5 says this. And you know that he was manifested or he he came to this earth and tabernacled among us. He was born, however you want to put it. We know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him was no sin. So we're going to talk about that for just a few minutes today. Jesus came to this earth to take away sins. The marvel of the Christmas celebration is the miracle of redemption. The birth of Christ was not an end. Uh, it was the, a part of a process that would culminate ultimately in the purchase of our redemption. He was born in order that you and I might be reborn, born again. But if all Christ did in his life was that he had a miraculous birth and then he led a normal life, but he died of natural causes and awaits the resurrection like our loved ones who have placed faith in Christ do, then there would be nothing to celebrate this season. We celebrate his birth because he lived a life and then he died a death and he was raised by a miraculous resurrection. Christ's birth was a part of a package, uh, if we want to put it in, in these terms. His birth was a part of a package of divine credentials. He brought with him these divine credentials when, when he, he lived out his life, and those divine credentials confirmed who he was, that babe in the manger that we see in the nativity scene so 
helpless, so small, was in fact God Almighty manifest in the flesh. And those little hands that, that moved with such uncontrolled caution were the very hands that set the earth to spinning and flung the stars into space. The voice that cried so softly in that stable is the very voice that is quoted in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 3 when God said, let there be and there was. Let there be light, let there be a firmament. Uh, we find out in other scriptures that that voice, that person speaking those words and creating all of this universe was in fact Jesus Christ. It says in the book of Hebrews that it was through Christ that the Father created the worlds. Those little eyes <laughs> that studied the face of his newfound parents are the very ones that the Bible says run to and fro throughout the earth searching for a man whose heart is perfect toward him. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that Jesus Christ was God. He was God manifest in the flesh and willing for a time to lay aside his glory, to set aside his omnipresence, and to confine himself for you and for me to the tabernacle of human flesh and to dwell among us. That's who we're talking about. That's who we celebrate this Christmas season and what wondrous things we're going to learn about the eternal God during the life of this little baby because through his life, we find out what God is like. And yet as Christ's relationships with mankind, we're going to prove in the years to come, the closer one gets to a true understanding of God, the more obvious their own sin appears. The very sin that has separated us from God in the first place is become, going to become more and more evident to those who draw close to Jesus Christ so that he not only revealed to us the marvelous glory of the Father, but also he revealed to us the terribleness of our own sin. All through the life of Christ, the sinfulness of mankind was made evident. John the Apostle, and, and probably the Apostle who was most uniquely affected by the divine nature of Christ, zeroes in on the reason for, for the condesc condescension of God to earth here in 1 John 3, 5. He states it simply in our text that the heart of Christ's purpose in coming is the issue of man's sinfulness and God's method of dealing with our sinfulness. Let me read it again. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him was no sin. So you have on the one hand the sinfulness of man. On the other hand, the sinlessness of the God-man, Jesus Christ. All kind of compressed together in that one verse in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 5. What I want to do this morning is I want to draw three simple lessons about Christ's fulfilling the purpose of taking away our sin. And I want you to notice with me these three things from this one verse. First thing I want us to notice is I want to talk for a few minutes about the person who is qualified. And we're talking about removing our sins there has to be a qualified person. It says at the end of that verse, 
and in him is no sin. If ever a person is to get saved, and if you're listening to me today and, and, and maybe, possibly, you've never heard the gospel. You, you've heard about Jesus. You've heard about his death. You've heard about his resurrection. But how that applies to you personally is something that you are not aware of. Is it something that you just have to believe in your mind? Uh, you know, you just acknowledge the, the history of it, that it actually happened and all of that. Is that what it means? Or is there something deeper that, that you need to know and that I need to know about these events if they are going to be applied to our life? Well, I think there is. And if ever a person is going to get saved, there are a couple of things that it is essential for them to understand. First of all, they have to understand their own sinfulness. All of us are sinners. There is no person who has ever walked the face of the earth outside of Jesus Christ himself who is without sin. We sin in thought, we sin in word, in deed, in motive. We sin in a variety of ways. We are filled with sin. We are born as sinners, and we take to sin quite naturally. We have to understand our own sinfulness, and secondly, if we're going to be saved, we have to understand Christ's divine purity, that Jesus Christ did no sin ever in any way. Jesus Christ was never tainted by sin. So you have to understand those two things. So Jesus came in part to emphasize man's sin by setting it in stark relief against the sinlessness of his own life. Black is never as black as when it is set against white. Right is, is never more revealing of what is wrong until they are set side by side. Jesus Christ marched <clears throat> through his life in holiness and in purity, and the closer he got to individuals, <clears throat> the more apparent their own sinfulness was to them. <clears throat> Remember that one time when uh, Simon Peter fell before the Lord and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me. I, I, don't even, I don't even have a right to be in your presence. You are sinless. I am sinful. And because of the stark reality of their own sinfulness that Christ's life made them face. No one ever stood on neutral ground toward him. They don't stand on neutral ground today toward Jesus Christ. You see, Christ's purity, the fact that he is without sin, is going to have one of two effects upon us. It is either going to draw us closer to him or it will drive us further from him. Nobody stands on neutral ground. Nobody looks at Jesus Christ and understands who he is and what he is and how he lived and the sinlessness of his life and stands there neutral. His life requires something of us. I must come closer to him or I must go further from him. There are people today who will not come or, or come reluctantly to a service where the gospel is going to be preached. And the reason they won't is because they don't want to hear any more about Christ's purity because it's going to force them to face their own sin. And before any person can ever come to faith in Jesus Christ, 
I mean, I, I know it seems like a contradiction. I know it seems like something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it has, uh, you have to understand that it is the truth. Before we can come and receive the forgiveness of Christ, we have to understand the sinfulness of our own sin. And many people don't want to hear about that. This is the reason someone's seeking with, with earnest to follow Jesus Christ meets with the rejection of the world. You, uh, Paul talked about it. He said, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Sin always seeks refuge in the darkness of error. And when the light of truth shines upon sin in your life or in mine, our instinctive reaction is to recoil from that light and then strike out at that light. What we face from the world is only an extension. If you're a believer in Christ, and you are truly seeking to live your life for him, then what you experience from the world in that context is only an extension of what Jesus Christ lived and what he faced. And the Bible, the New Testament talks about that as well. Lost men, and I'm talking of men and women, I'm talking about lost people, have always sought to find sin in Christ. <clears throat> because if they can ever find evidence of one false word or, or one sinful deed or a misjudgment or a, a abiding sinful comment that Jesus Christ made or a lustful thought or an immoral deed or a, an, a vindictive act, on the part of Jesus Christ, then what that would do would be to strip away the authority and the authenticity of every statement that he made, every claim that he made, every deed that Jesus Christ accomplished in his life would be called into question because he who, who tells us that he came to be our sin bearer was himself a sinful man, if that is the case. For over 2,000 years, the forces of evil have launched an unrelenting attack upon the character and nature of Jesus Christ. Some people question whether or not he was actually an historical figure. Did he really live? Did, did he really exist? I mean, I've seen television programs on this. You probably have too. And so these scholars, the scholars come in and they tell us why there's real doubt as to whether Jesus Christ lived. They, they explain away his miracles. They mock his resurrection. And, and all of these things are, are to prove to the listener that Jesus Christ was not what he claimed to be. And if he's not what he claimed to be, then he is not the qualified person to take away our sin. For 2,000 years, they have probed this. For 2,000 years, papers have been written, speeches have been given about Jesus Christ and that he is not who he claimed to be. And in spite of all of their effort and all of their claims, the statement of John made 2,000 years ago in this letter that he wrote that we call 1 John, it stands without successful contradiction. You stop and think about that. It still stands today without successful contradiction. They can speculate, they can make their claims, but there is no successful contradiction to, to what John said in 1 John 3 and verse number 5, and in him 
was no sin. And I want you, I, I want us to, to remember that when John wrote this down, there were still many, many people who saw Christ personally, who rubbed shoulders with Christ, who knew him on a personal basis. And John said, in him was no sin. Christ himself stood before a crowd of, of unbelievers. He stood before in John chapter eight. They were not only unbelievers, they were hostile to him. They'd have killed him if they could have, right there in John chapter eight. And after confronting them with their sin, Jesus Christ laid down this challenge in John chapter eight and verse number 46. He said to this hostile crowd who already wanted to kill him, they despised him because he, he confronted the status quo. He called them on the carpet because of their sin. And Jesus said to this crowd that was all worked up, he said to them, which of you convinceth or convicts me of sin? Whoa. <laughs> wow. What a challenge. You know, Christ standing there before the religious leaders who were thought very highly of in Israel. And he, and he says essentially, you know, come on, boys, which one of you can convict me of any sin. That is either unbelievable arrogance or divine confidence. And you and I have to decide which it is in our own mind. Is Jesus Christ telling the truth? You can't convict me of, skin, of sin. And in spite of their, their hatred for him, and in spite of, of the hostility they had toward him because of the message that he preached, because, and, and, and the anger they had toward him at the audacity to confront them with their own sin, and, and from their standpoint, the, the absolute arrogance of making such a challenge. In spite of all of that, with the air filled with hatred and hostility toward him, not one person in that hostile, hate-filled mob could step forward with evidence of one sin that Christ had committed. That's an amazing thing. Because Jesus wasn't hiding away. He wasn't some mealy-mouthed uh, uh, preacher or prophet. Can you imagine which one of you hate-filled people can stand forward in this crowd and convict me of sin? Which one of you saw me sin? Which one of you have heard me in my speech sin? Nobody. You know, it'd be one thing if it was a hundred years removed from when Jesus lived for somebody to stand up and say he was without sin. It, it'd be something if it were a thousand years after he walked this earth. But this was at the very time when the hostilities in Israel were, were beginning to boil over. These are in the last days of his life when ultimately the mob was going to take him and kill him. And he lays down this challenge. How many of us would dare lay down that challenge today to say even to our friends, those who support us? Anybody here uh, ever seen me sin? 
<laughs> we're not going to do it because there'd be too many hands raised. Jesus Christ was supremely qualified to deal with our sin because he wasn't blinded by sin. He was not hindered by sin. And the reason he was not is because he had no sin. He was a sinless human being. So that Christ today, for you and for me, is the measuring stick by which God measures all men. Now some who may listen today <clears throat> Uh, it can can point to someone who calls themselves a Christian or or some preacher who preaches what you ought to do but doesn't do it himself. Or point to somebody who claims to be a Christian who will steal you blind. Or somebody who will run around on their wife or or lie through their teeth and they and you say to to other people, you know, I'm certainly better than they are. And well, you may be, but the point that I want to make is that they're not the issue. They're not the issue. They are not the standard. Thank God, they're not the standard. God's holiness and your and my sinfulness are the issue. And Christ came to show us just how far short we fall of God's standard. So the person qualified, in him was no sin. That made him qualified to take away our sin. Second thing I want you to notice is that the problem had to be dealt with. <clears throat> I just want to look at that little five word phrase to take away our sins. Uh, and we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. In all of his life, 33 and a half years, roughly, we don't know exactly, but in all of his life, Jesus Christ never lost sight of the reason for his coming. He came to take away our sins. It's important that we understand biblical terminology here. Sin in the, in the Bible, in the scriptures, is referred to in two ways. First of all, as sin, singular. Sin, and, and when it speaks of of sin in that sense, in the singular sense, it is, it is talking about a principle, the principle of sin that resides in all of us. The reason we sin is because the principle of sin abides in us. It's in us. And it is as, uh, it is from that that all lawlessness and disobedience comes. So the Bible talks about sin as a principle of the life of human beings. Secondly, sins, that's plural. And, and sins, when the Bible talks about sins, it talks about the sum total of all the lawless acts that we have done. So when John says he came to take away our sins, He's talking about the accumulated acts of lawlessness that we have uh, done in our lives. That's what he's talking about. And the more profound of the two uses of that word is the, the singular, sin. But that which is dealt with here is sins. He's talking about the sum total. The idea of sin in the Bible is that of missing the mark. It's like uh, taking a bow and arrow and, you know, pulling it back and, and you're aiming or like a dart game and you're aiming for a mark. And the idea of sin 
is to miss the mark. And the plural use of that term would let us know that we do it often. We miss the mark a lot because the mark of God is perfection. Now, the point that John is making here is the truth conveyed in the Old Testament practice of the scapegoat. We've all heard that term. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest of, of Israel, on the behalf of Israel, would place his hands upon the scapegoat in a, a ceremonial transfer of sins to that animal. Now it was symbolic, but that that's what it symbolized, that the sins of Israel were being transferred to this animal, and then the animal, the goat, would be taken into the wilderness, and it would never be seen again in Israel. And what it did is it pictured for these people, it pictured what Christ does for us. The term to take away there means to bear something. And if you, if you follow uh, this word to its Hebrew root word, it means to list or, or to list our sins. The high priest, when he had his hands on that scapegoat, he would, he would repeat 613 laws of Israel and confess in, in the law, he would confess that they had violated those laws and and had sinned against the Lord in that violation and symbolically that, the, that those transgressions would be transferred to that goat. The idea is that Christ comes into the life of one who will trust him, receive him as their Lord and Savior, and he will get under our sins, that, that burden of our sins, every sin on our personal list, whether it's sins of, of commission or omission, whether it's immorality or drug addiction or or unfaithfulness, or whatever the sin is, Christ will get under every sin on our list and lift them off of us onto himself and then take them away. That's the picture. Every person of every culture in the course of human history knows by instinct that the one thing that separates him from his God is his own sin. So that every system of religion is designed to make a way for men to atone for their sins and be united in fellowship again with the God they worship. And the thing that, that sets Christianity apart from other religions is that it teaches us that we don't remove our own sins by our own acts of penitence. I cannot be sorry enough. I cannot do enough. I cannot pray enough. I cannot offer uh, enough sacrifice to take care of my sin before a holy God. And so God himself, in the person of his son, gets underneath my list of sinfulness and lifts that from me and takes the sin, the burden of my sin, upon himself and pays our penalty for us. And in that process, he unites us again with God. That is how God has dealt with the problem of your sin. 
He doesn't ask you to be good enough. He doesn't ask you to be uh, giving enough. He doesn't ask for any acts of service. He tells you and me to come before him, acknowledging our sin, repenting, and that means to turn from, change your mind about, agree with God concerning, to repent of our sins and trust the work of Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing, as the means whereby God will forgive those sins and receive you into his family. That is either the greatest message that has ever been delivered to men, or it is the greatest fraud that has ever been perpetrated upon the human race. There is this morning in the heart of every person here a consciousness of our own sins because none of us are sinless. In fact, John says in the book of 1 John, he who says he is without sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. We may not think upon our guilt every waking moment, but it is nonetheless there. We are aware of our guilt before God. And there are those, maybe some listening to me right now, who spend a lifetime trying to find a way to deal with it, find a way to unburden themselves from the drag of guilt upon their life and upon their conscience. There are some people who seek to excuse it. You know, I, you know, I, I'm no different than anybody else. And, and you're not. Others may try to deny it and, and say, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's not that bad. Some people try to pleasure it away. Other people uh, try to drink it into oblivion. Others try to drug it to death. And some people try to religion it to death. But that gnawing of heart continues because they know that their sins have separated between them and God. But however men may choose to deal with it, in whatever way they may choose, the fact remains that the one thing we hate most about our past is our own sin. The greatest tragedy of human existence is guilt before God. If we could just make it go away, if we could, could somehow make it not be, we would do whatever we had to do to rid ourselves of that plague of mind and heart. In concert with that thought, this statement of John's is either the cruelest statement ever uttered or it is the most sublime, one of the two. In him was no sin as compared to us. If somewhere and at some time one was found who had the power and who had the qualifications and the will to take up our sins and take them away, that would be a greater gift than any gift a human being could possibly give. And yet there are people seemingly who have it all together as you look at them on the outside but who are on the inside the prisoners of their own past and the prisoner of their present. People who are crying for someone to, to get under that burden that so weighs them down and to lift that burden from them and to take it away. Now there are no doubt people like that who are listening to me right now. You may be a teenager just starting out and, and you are pulled by every pressure to conform and, and by George, you've tried to conform, but you're now aware of the guilt that must be dealt with after it. You may be an adult, maybe a parent bringing your children to church to help them avoid the sin that you practiced, but that, that you are still burdened by the guilt of those sins yourself. You may be a grandparent, uh, 
more aware than ever before that the time of your life is drawing short, but you're still unable to be at peace with yourself about the sins of the past. <clears throat> the primary issue of life for us is this. What are you going to do about the sin that has separated you from God? John the Baptist was baptizing one time and Christ came and, and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. How's God going to deal with it? He dealt with it through Christ. Not through you, through Christ. One last thing and very briefly, the purpose is stated and you know that he was manifested. In the clearest terms, Christ's purpose for coming in relation to our sins is stated. He came to bear them away. Every person listening to me today is going to deal with your sin in one way or the other. You're going to deal with it your way and, and you're going to do that by default. If you do nothing about them, then it's by default. You're going to deal with them your way or you're going to deal with them God's way. And that's by our choice. God has provided a way. He said, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. The bottom line is which way are you going to choose? I pray today that you'll choose Christ, Him alone, without religion, uh, without ceremony, just Him. Because in Him was no sin. He was qualified. He was the person designated to deal with your sin. Because in Him, there was none. Father, I pray today that you'll bless this message, that you'll use it in the lives of those who've heard, and that we will understand the purpose of your coming, and that that purpose might be fulfilled in us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you, and have a great day.